This is video number four for your last honors packet um, on applications of vectors. So we're going to do some story problems. Um, if you think about an airplane, and it is going to be flying 475 miles per hour west. So part of this, we're going to be assuming that you know north, south, east, west. So west is that direction. So in case you have forgotten, north, south, east. Okay, so the airplane is flying 475 miles per hour west. Now imagine that there is a wind that is blowing from the opposite direction from the west, and it's going 25 miles per hour. So what is the wind doing to the plane? So obviously it's pushing at the plane, so opposite directions. Well, which one has more force? The plane has more force, and so it's still going to be going its direction, just slowing down a little bit. So the way that we can look at that is we can say this vector that's 475, and then we're going to take back 25 of it. So the magnitude of the resultant vector, or what we say the resultant velocity or speed, is going to be 475 minus 25, which would be 450 miles per hour. So with the wind, it slows down the plane a little bit, and so that's our resultant velocity. So when you have a situation like that, you might have, if you have a plane going that direction and you have a tailwind, that means it's pushing it. So that means that the velocity, the resultant will be faster or more. If you have a plane going that direction and you have a headwind, that means it's pushing against it. That's what we just saw right here. If you have a plane that's going this direction and we have what's called a crosswind, it means it's pushing it in an opposite direction, not an opposite direction, but a contrary direction. So um, that's what we would be seeing there. So we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Okay, the next type of problem that we see with vectors a lot are what are commonly referred to as riverboat problems. And so it's kind of like what it sounds like. So we're going to talk about a canoe, and it's going to go directly across a river. We're going to be heading in the east direction at 3.5 meters per second. The water is going to be flowing north at 2 meters per second. So if you visualize this, the canoe is going east. I'll have a better picture in a second. And the water is flowing that direction. So what's that going to do to the canoe? So if you think about the water flowing, then the canoe is going to end up going that direction. So where it's originally heading east and the water is pushing north, it's going to be heading in a northeast direction. So if you're asked what direction it's going, you can just say that. Now when you learn trig and you do more with physics later on, maybe in you know high school or something, you'll learn more about how to find how many degrees northeast, but we're not doing that. We're just keeping it very, very simple. So here's our picture of the canoe. And so the first question is, what is the resultant vector of the canoe? And then what does it mean? So the resultant vector is going to be, if we think about it, like here's the canoe. And then since I know that the water is pushing it that direction, I can actually think of it as adding, hold on, crooked line, adding vectors like that. And so what is happening is my canoe is going to end up going like that. And so this would be my resultant vector. And so that's what I'm trying to find. So the way that we do that is we are going to make um, a picture like that, and then our Pythagorean theorem will be what we're going to use to do that. So we set up the picture like this, and we can use the Pythagorean theorem to say 2 squared plus 3.5 squared equals my resultant squared. And so you put this in your calculator, and then you're going to take the square root of it, and you're going to get that r is approximately equal to 4.03. And so we can just say that it's approximately 4, and that's going to be in meters per second. And so that's the result in velocity. So what that means is, and this is a little bit harder to understand, if there was no current, if the water was still, the boat would be moving 3.5 meters every second. However, because the current is pushing it, it's going this direction and it's covering more ground, not ground, water. It's covering more, and it's so it's covering 4 meters per second instead of 3.5. Now the boat itself is going the same speed because the motor's not changing, but the current is pushing it along so it's covering more water. 
Okay, then the next question is, if I've got the river and it's 698 meters across, okay, um, a couple of questions. Um, how long does it take to get across? And so a lot of people think that because it's four meters per second on the resultant, that that's what we're going to look at, and that's actually not what we're going to look at. Because, like I said, it's still taking the same amount of seconds to go this direction as it is to go here. It's just that when I do this right here, it's just covering more ground in the same amount of time. Um, if you go online to the physicsclassroom.com and do a search on that page for riverboat questions, there's an animation that looks like this. And unfortunately, I can't show you the animation on this. But it shows you how the two boats are crossing, one without any current and one with a current. And they actually end up in the, across the shore at the exact same time. So that's a really good way to understand this. So Physics Classroom is a really good resource for understanding this if you're having a hard time with that. Okay, so back to this question. How are we going to figure out how long does it take? You just are simply going to do 698 divided by how fast is the boat going. It's going 3.5 meters every second. And so when you do that division, it's approximately equal to 199 seconds. So that's about how long it's going to take for that canoe to cross the river. So like I said with that um, website that I was saying, um, it's kind of hard to understand that. But one thing that we say about these two components, these are our perpendicular components. And so perpendicular components are independent of each other, and that's the part on your notes where it has this arrow right there. The independent, that means it doesn't matter how fast the current is pushing it or how strong it's pushing it. It will still take the same amount of time for it to cross the river. It's just how much water is it going to cover in that same amount of time is the different question. Okay, so going back to the other question that we're asking, um, we're asking how far does the canoe travel during this time? So if we're, if the, actually let me go back to this picture. If we are crossing the river in one second, you're going to cover 3.5 meters, okay? Because that's what the boat is doing. So in one second, And so what I want to know, since I know that it's going to take me 199 seconds, in 199 seconds, how many meters am I going to cover? So you can do this two ways. The first way, which is probably easier, is if you just, okay, hold on. Sorry, I said that wrong. Um, in one second, um, we're going two meters upstream. That's in one second. And so one second is two meters. And then in another second, we're going to go another two meters. And in another second, we're going to go another two meters. So we're going to do 199 seconds. How many meters is that? So we're going to do 199 times two. And we're going to end up approximately 398 meters downstream. So that means that if I stay in the boat and I go across, Instead of ending up straight across from where I started, I'm going to end up, you know, upstream here, 398 meters up there. Okay, now the other way that you can do this is using similar triangles. I don't care which way you do it. It doesn't really matter. Um, whichever way makes more sense for you is fine. So if I think about it like this, this is going to take me 600, this is going to be 698 I don't know how far that is. Okay, this is in one second. This is my entire trip. So I can set up actually a proportion. And so I would say 2 over 3.5 equals x over 698. And then if you remember how to solve proportions, you would multiply both sides by 698. And then do the math. 698 times 2, and then divide it by 3.5, and you're going to get approximately 398 as well. So that's how far 
upstream you're going to go. And so when it says how far does the canoe travel, so this question right here, okay, we're looking for that component that's for the entire trip. So if you have questions about that, you can come and ask me, or again, I would encourage you to go look at the physics classroom um, pages on that. It's very informative and very helpful. Um, there is some trig stuff in there that you'll just have to go past. Okay, and then the last thing to talk about is just back to the plane idea. If the plane is going, its velocity is 100 kilometers per hour, so it's heading south, and the wind is going to be heading west at 25 kilometers per hour, what it's doing is basically doing this right here. So you've got the south component, you've got the west component. The plane is going to end up going southwest. Okay, so a real plane, they're going to compensate for that. So the question is then, is, so if this is one hour, then the plane's going 100 that way, and the wind is going 25 that way, so how much airspace, I guess, does the plane end up covering? And so that's where you would, again, use your um, Pythagorean theorem to find that resultant vector. So 100 squared plus 25 squared, and you're going to put that in your calculator, and then that's equal to my resultant squared, so r is equal to the square root of that number. And so that's going to be approximately 103.1, and that's kilometers per hour. And so that's where that plane is going. It's going to cover, instead of just going 100, because the plane or the wind is pushing it, it's going to actually cover more space just in a different direction than it was originally heading. Okay, so that covers it. If you've got any questions, please come and ask me. And you're now ready to do your worksheet on this section.